Good afternoon and welcome to the University of Manitoba Alumni and Friends Virtual Learning for Life series. This is our fifth session of a total of nine weeks. My name is Tracy Bowman and I'm the Director of Alumni Relations and a proud UM alumna and will be the moderator for today's session. Thank you for joining us and making this event part of your day and in general for choosing to stay connected with your alma mater in this way. We have been able to offer this program free of charge to all of our 145,000 alumni living in 140 countries around the world, thanks to the very generous sponsorship of one of the U of M's affinity partners, IA Financial. Many thanks to them. Delivering learning for life opportunities is a very important role for the University of Manitoba, and we are proud that we are able to showcase so many of our leading professors and researchers in this way. Now, just a few housekeeping details before I introduce today's present, uh, presenter. You will be viewing this webinar on YouTube like you have the past few weeks. You will see both of our presenter and as well as her PowerPoint presentation. Today's session is being recorded and will be posted to our website in the next day or two. You were, sent, uh, you were also sent a link to Slido. That website is www.sli.do and a password, which is VL03. I will, and that is where you're able to post your questions throughout the session as well as at the end. And then I, as the moderator, will be asking your questions on your behalf of our pre presenter. And I will get through as many as I can. So now I'd like to introduce our speaker today, who is Dr. Tina Chen, who will be presenting on China in Literature, Travelogues and History, Lessons for International Engagement in Times of Isolation. Now, just a bit about Dr. Chen. She is the department head and professor with the Department of History in the Faculty of Arts. Her research areas of specialty include modern China, intellectual and cultural history, Cold War, War culture and Cold War Asia, film projection and film cultures in socialist and post-socialist China, and Chinese migration and documentary regimes. So with that, over to you, Dr. Chen. Thank you so much for having me today. Um, it's uh, you know such a privilege to be able to join this group and to share with you some of my thoughts at the moment. Um, and you know, I'd like to begin by acknowledging that the University of Manitoba is on Treaty One territory, the um, traditional lands of the Anishinaabe, Cree, Oji, Cree, Dakota, and Dene people, and the homeland of the Métis Nation. And I think particularly at this moment, many of us are thinking about issues um, that are both within Winnipeg, got, but in North America and globally. Um, and so, while this talk began with me really um, thinking in the context of COVID-19 and what it means when we have restrictions on travel and what it means to try and learn and think about a part of the world that for many of us, um, some of the alumni um, online today may be living in Asia um, and not being able to travel to North America, Manitoba in the way that they may be used to. And for those of us who um, were used to traveling to Asia on a regular basis, that is kind of an unknown future and very uncertain at the moment. So I wanted to um, step back and think a little bit about what does it mean to learn about China in this context? And in some ways, how can we continue this kind of cultural learning, but also international engagement in a time of isolation and where we have new concerns? And so I've put together a kind of series of thoughts on this and I've given it the shorthand in my mind um, to, and as I've been talking with colleagues and friends about it, as it's a bit of a, you know, thinking out loud about the joys and perils of, of traveling virtually, of that kind of being an armchair tourist and what that means. And so I am today I'm gonna to be sharing with you what are some of my favorite works that I often teach, that I talk about with colleagues, but they're also um, films, memoirs, um, and kind of travel literature that we have to be quite um, critically engage with how we receive that information and what we do with it. And so that's kind of where I'd like to go today. And I'm really looking forward to the, um, question period at the end to hear your thoughts. Um, and I will be um, showing a few clips through the day, throughout the time. So right now I'm just gonna pull up my PowerPoint so that you can have access to those and we can begin to think about these in a little bit more specific context. So 
Um, what I'm talking about today then, as Tracy already said, is this idea of China and literature travel logs and history. And I wanted to begin by first referring to and drawing your attention to one of the key thinkers about the idea of Orientalism, and that would be Edward Said. And in many ways, when we think about how we get to know China and what China means for all of us, we have to think about what it means to be part of the Orient. Now, when Edward Said wrote about the Orient, he spoke most specifically about um, the Middle East, um, and but we have very much extended that to include East Asia in this context. And what and in this quote, what I brought your attention to is he says, in order to get at the Orient, he and that's he's talking about writers must pass through the learned grids and codes provided by the Orientalist. And in this um, quote, what Edward Said is um, reminding us of is that we can't come to know a place without also coming to know and think critically about who provided that information to us and what were the frameworks for their understanding. And so first, before we even begin today, I want us to keep in play throughout the, my discussion this afternoon, this idea of the Orientalist and so and what Orientalism is. And so again, here's another kind of longer, much longer quote from Edward Said. And he's talking about the principal dogmas of Orientalism, as and he says, as he's writing and the, the topic of his book, Orientalism, concerns studies of the Arabs and Islam, but they're equally applicable to what we, how we learn about East Asia and China in particular. And so when he lays them out here, there, you can see them kind of brought out to you in bold, I mean, in the blue. And he says, you know, first, that there is the absolute and systematic difference between the West and this idea that the West is construed as rational, it's developed, it's humane, it's, and it's superior. And that the opposite of the West is something that is unusual, it's an aberrant, it's undeveloped, it's inferior. And, you know, I think particularly those of us who've spent time in Manitoba, and I think because you're all alumni, this, that would be this group, um, we know that being a settler colonial society, that these ideas are not only aimed at the Orient, but often the way in which colonialism and racial hierarchies are created globally and in, reinforced. But this idea of difference and systematic difference between the West and the other is a key part of Orientalism. Now, Edward Said in his work reminds us that when people work on the Orient, in many ways, they're, they're not so much giving insight onto, into the so-called Orient, but they're actually telling us much more about themselves and the way they see the world. And so we want to keep that in mind as well. Now, the second part of it that Said draws our attention to is this idea that the abstractions about the Orient, particularly those based in text, represent um, is what people are looking at. So they look towards so-called classical Oriental civilization, things of the deep past, the traditions, and that in that they're not as interested in the kind of modern experiences. And so that there's an assumption that certain people are kind of rooted in their past, that's how they have meaning, whereas others are part of a modern reality. And what this does is it reinforces the idea of the Western subject, the Western person being more modern than somebody located elsewhere. Now, the third part of this is linked to that, the idea that the Orient is eternal, uniform and incapable of defining itself. And again, these are about generalizations, but also that there's a bit of a timelessness and this idea that the Orient, even when seen in its best characteristics, doesn't change that much. And that if there is change, that change actually comes from outside and that it comes from those who are more scientific and objective explaining it to them. And so we begin to see these questions again, linking back to the first idea about being rational or developed. And then the fourth point that we have to keep in mind is the idea that the Orient at its very base is either something to be feared, and we've seen that historically in moments like the yellow peril, and I think in this moment of COVID-19, many in the Asian communities have you know, been thinking about those experiences of the yellow peril, racism, and whether it's the Canadian context of the head tax and the way that fear of Asians um, drove systemic racism as part of our past and that apologies have then been issued. But it's either something to be feared or controlled. And that is by either pulling people into you know, the system, having the same beliefs, me methods of assimilation, or where that can um, be possible, outright occupation. And so Edward Said sort of talks to us about these different ways that knowing the Orient comes into place. And so this takes us back to that very first quote where he says, well, even to get to the Orient, to get to China and to kind of get at what it might mean, we often are already being taken into these grids and codes of the Orientalist as I've outlined for you. So I'm bringing this up at the outset because I think um, we really need to think critically about what do we know about China? How do we come to know it? And in many ways, it's that the third question is the most crucial in this one. It's 
why do we find certain ways of knowing about China to be convincing and to be the ones that we want to accept or the most comfortable? And so I'm going to take us through some that examples. And again, as I've already said, the examples I'm going to look at today are pieces um, things that I highly recommend people to read, to watch as films. They are, I think, really excellent pieces of work. And so when we go through into this kind of next stage about thinking about travel, we have to really be aware of the kind of double edged nature and that, you know, obviously the answer is not, isn't, isn't to not know about places, but that we want to be able to kind of think critically about them. And so um, in the talk today, I've kind of divided this up. I'm going to talk a little bit about travel and travel logs first. Then I will go on and talk about, I'm trying to make sure I've got the right order, films. And then I'll move from there to talk about some of the memoirs that have been really um, popular and important at the moment. So in this moment, I want us to think a little bit about how travel companies promote the idea of China and travel in China. And I think this is our reality at this moment. Most of us will not have opportunities to travel very much in the next um, you know, few months or years coming year. And so that means that our access to places and for those who are like me, who love to travel, will be very much shaped by um, how others have traveled, the, the stories that they tell, the photographs that they share, the video, the videos that they share, the way that travel companies continue to keep us interested about travel. And in this context then, we, and when we think about Asia, we have to realize that many of our um, ideas of travel in China really are shaped by early travel logs of the 19th and 20th centuries. And this means that the perspectives of missionaries as they moved across and keeping very detailed and careful accounts of their interactions, both with people, but with landscape are a key part of this. Um, businessmen who traveled as we move through different moments and sometimes um, they're moving through different parts of Asia so that they have a kind of comparative framework they're bringing to bear. But in many ways, these travel logs are often fascinated about what makes China different. What is incomprehensible in China and what then do they feel the need to explain? And travel, travel literature and travel logs kind of move in this direction. I'm, I think most people don't really want to hear about what's the same that they might have you know, experienced if they stayed home, but they want to know what have been the risks, what are the dangers, what, what did you learn, what was so different and extreme that you didn't expect it? And so when we look at these, we also want to think about the way that travel writing, at least in the 20th century, really has been about these also searches for authenticity and the desire to discover what it is that really constitutes um, the kind of true heart of the culture and people under observation. And I've used those words quite carefully because it's the, I finished by saying the people under observation and this idea that when we go and we travel, we are observing others. And often, you know, for many of us where we travel, we have language barriers. So even communication is a little bit um, less, it's, it doesn't open up new spaces, but rather we're observing and making sense of others through the frameworks that we bring into place. And so when we look at travel in China, um, I just want to kind of start about thinking about, well, what does it mean when we look at this from an international perspective, but also how does it look from the context of China itself? And so just to kind of draw people's attention to, there are of course companies with a longstanding history um, in China, like Thomas Cook and the American Express Company. And in the early 20th century, the Tourist Bureau and tourism is really um, overseen as well by the Japanese run Tourist Bureau. And what it, this comes to the attention of Chung Wang Fu in the 1920s. He, at the time, is the head of the Shanghai Commercial and Savings Bank. And he's extremely frustrated, as he tells it, with an encounter at the Thomas Cook Tourist um, Agency, where he feels that the Chinese in, are not getting the same kind of attention. And so he decides that what he needs to do is establish the Chinese, a Chinese-run tourist agency. And this is the China Travel Service. It continues to operate. Um, and alongside this, what um, Chung Wang Fu does, is he has quite a vision. And he says, well, for what travel should look like and how the industry should be created. And so alongside this, he creates as well a travel magazine in 1923. And this travel -like magazine is called China Traveler. And so what he does through this is that he places this within the longer tradition of literati or um, those, the elite travel logs and their route books. 
And what we want to think about here is that travel logs really are this way of kind of a meditation on the natural environment, how they've been encountered with them. Route books are much more practical. They tell you which, you know, which train to get on to, how to move goods from one place to the other. So they're quite different in that. But for anyone who's ever traveled and um, depended on their travel books, <laughs> they will know that, you know, the combination of both sets of information is often useful. And what we see happening in China is from the 1920s forward, guidebooks really combine these functions. And one of the things that I think is very interesting about Chen Guangfu is that he identifies right from the beginning that through this magazine, through the magazine China Traveler, Lu Sheng Zhazhi, what he wants to do is create so-called armchair travelers. And what he wants to do is ensure that when travel does become standardized and safe, that people who've now been reading this magazine will see themselves as tourists. And while I was preparing for this talk, this really struck me because I thought, well, you know, this is exactly what the industries are going to have to do now. This is, you know, we all are in a moment where travel, it does not feel particularly safe. And then the implications of travel impact all parts of your lives. And so the idea about, well, how do you continue to have people see themselves as tourists so that when the possibility is there, that they will then physically become tourists. And this idea that being an armchair traveler is important. So what he does in the 1920s is he creates his magazine. It's beautiful. It's on glossy paper. They have a number of high quality photographs. And it also includes news stories, um, poetry, authors who are writing serialized detective and travel stories, and some of the most well-known authors at the time period, as well as travel logs. And the purpose of the travel logs really was, as it says here, to transform readers into tourists. And he wants them to, um, and this is a quote from Miriam Gross's work, he wants that he would see that they should, they realize that travel could heighten their fantasies and give depth to the identity as modern Chinese. And so here right away, we have this idea of fantasy, the idea of an imagined other place, something that is not your everyday life. And so when we think about travel, travel itself is already folded into these ideas of trying to find something outside the ordinary to have a different type of encounter. And particularly in this moment as well, it's part of being a modern citizen, the ability to travel. So which is distinguished from the um, necessity to move for work, for sus sustenance, for food, um, for basic needs. That's different than travel. Travel is about leisure. And so being able to take advantage of um, the leisure moments of travel is something that they saw as being a modern um, of being a modern citizen. And here then we see that kind of link about having to explore China, but also to see yourself becoming more Western. And here, just um, to give you a sense of what the China Traveler magazine looked like in the 1920s and 1930s, I have a few images. The one on the upper left um, shows you the kind of the types of painting, the landscape, the way that it's placed in this idea of kind of remoteness, but also the beauty of the landscape. Then you have in the middle photograph, um, a young woman who is clearly depicted as modern. She's traveling, she's got the hat on, um, not necessarily in what we would think of as standard feminine clothing. And so that she's getting ready to travel, but she's claimed her space as a modern subject. And then in the upper corner, you see the advertisement for the China Travel Service and the related Shanghai Commercial Bank's traveler checks. So the idea that also there are modes that you would travel in that would make it safer. And so all these parts come together. And again, I want to keep all these in play because it reminds us about how what we understand is essential and the meaning of travel is also part of the information that we received and given through companies and the way that they want to create um, and understand travel in those contexts. So with that um, quick background, a little bit about thinking of travel in China, I want to move up much more to the contemporary moment. And one of the reasons that, you know, I am particularly, you know, disappointed that I won't be traveling to China in the near future is that food in China really is a fantastic and important part of the experience at all times. And, you know, it, it does not go... Um, you know, by the wayside, any of the times that I've traveled to China, where I check in with friends who've recently been in cities, cities change and transform at such a rapid pace to ask about what their favorite restaurants are, what's going on in all of these contexts. And so I wanted to think a little bit about the relationship between food and travel. And this, again, is one of those. Here's a book to highly recommend it for those of you who are thinking about a little bit of armchair travel yourself. Um, so Fuchsia Dunlop is a food um, writer and um, with a travel log and the book that is falls within the travel log kind of and memoir genre most directly is her book Shark's Fin and Sichuan Pepper, a sweet sour memoir of eating in China. And Fuchsia Dunlop is really um, has an exceptional experience of her own. 
she begins to take Chinese language as part of her um, her university life in Great Britain. And she goes to China and she's supposed to study politics, but really what she finds is her passion for food. And in that moment, she then is able to talk her way into becoming the first Westerner to train as a chef at the Sichuan Institute of Higher Cuisine. And I'm gonna show you, I'm just gonna move off of this um, and pull you up a clip of her just taking people through street food because I feel like if we're gonna armchair travel, we should see a bit of China as well. <laughs> So I just have to move to the next one, I think. And let me get to my, um, I'm going to stop that screen. <laughs> and my apologies for those of you who are having to hear me um, talk through all of this, but um, there we go. I think I should be pulling up. Let me just see, make sure. Okay, share screen. I may have to make sure. I'm not sure who gets to, you know, tell me if I've shared the possible screen. So if I, so I'm hoping what you now see, oh, sorry, and this is not even, my apologies on that one because that is the incorrect one. Here we go. Let's um, get back over here and I'll believe I am, okay, share screen, share. And I believe we should have um, Fuchsia Dunlop taking Fuchsia you through. Fuchsia encounter a street vendor selling a tantalizing and wholesome snack. Just even the old days, everywhere you went in Chengdu, you'd find all these um, snack sellers selling what they call xiaoche, small eats, these favorite little local snacks. And I'm really excited to come across this one because this is um, this is a, the, the equipment carried by a traditional seller of flower bean curd, silken bean curd, douhua. And they always used to carry these um, um, black and red wooden barrels with all their all their gear, their flavorings, their bowls. But these days, they're quite hard to find. This is silk and bean curd that, that's um, tofu that's not been pressed, so it's really custardy and light and melt in your mouth. It's still warm. It will have been freshly made. Awesome. Okay. This is awesome. Uh -huh. Soy sauce. Chili oil. Inevitably. Of course, right? Yeah. Finely cut scallion. A bit of that will tie. That's um, preserved that mustard tea. They're lovely and crisp and sour. Deep fried soybeans. A bit of ground roasted Sichuan pepper for that lip tingling zing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. A little bit of sugar. Ah, sugar. Like, 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 Look at Wait. that. <laughs> oh my God. Oh, so soft. Yeah. So I'm just going to um, take this one off now. So we'll stop sharing that screen and I will move back to my um, PowerPoint as we get over here now. So as I, I, I should go over to this one. Uh, I hope. Um, let's see. So I'm hoping that you are now sharing with me my screen again with the um, Fuchsia Dunlop, but I wanted to share that with you to get a sense of the way that we experience questions of authenticity and also to appreciate the, you know, Fuchsia Dunlop is somebody with who shares with us through Shark's Fin and Sichuan Pepper, her experiences of learning to cook in China, what it means to be a female chef um, in a largely male dominant profession, what it means to be um, a Westerner who is learning Chinese and then becomes very fluent in Chinese, um, but also working in the provincial area of Sichuan itself. And so what we see during this is kind of a, a way of narrating and telling the story, but also one of the, um, Concerns sometimes with Fuchsia Dunlop's work that um, critics have responded to is the way that it's always narrated through a notion of difference. And so she's very well known for explaining why you might want to eat, um, you know, things like intestines or sea cucumbers or others that we don't necessarily think are regular. So the idea of what's different, what's unusual, and trying to place it within these orders. So on one hand, her story is just fascinating. And I've read this memoir a few times. It always makes me um, extremely hungry. And I have, in fact, then gone and bought almost all of her cookbooks, although I can only very um, loosely approximate any of the food that I've ever eaten in Sichuan. But this idea of kind of an authenticity and I've also up here, you see this um, picture of where she often leads um, food tours as part of her um, profession now. And so this idea of how you reach people through these intimate and very close experiences. And so we get a sense of how travel is about 
how we eat, but also how we come to understand them and who are our kind of um, interlocutors, who is helping us understand that. Um, so I wanted to sort of kind of begin thinking in those terms because food is always so central to the experience, but also how do we narrate that experience of food? And um, when you begin to think about, well, how am I gonna learn about China from afar? Highly recommended is Fuchsia Dunlop's um, Food and Travel, but I hope as you read it, you'll continue to think about some of those frameworks and cautions that Edward Said brings forward in Orientalism about how we come to know other places. Places. One of the other parts that we can think about in terms of travel is that often, um, you know, and I get asked this in many occasions about if someone is getting ready to go to China, what films would I recommend that they study? And um, film history and films in China is one of the areas that I do a great deal of research. So I spend quite a bit of time watching films. The films sorry, that I, I study. Did oh, you have sorry. a PowerPoint that was uh, uh, being shared for oh. this? Sorry, let me pull that up again. I'm glad you said that. I thought it was up, but let me, you can let me know if it should be shared. Will you be able to? It's up now. Yeah, perfect. Okay, good. Thank you so much. I know it's hard to tell on my one screen. Sorry, everybody who's been watching, probably me just, you know, sitting there talking. So one of the things that we have through, um, I think this part is people often ask what types of films are, you know, good to watch to be able to get a better understanding of how they see China and I think and how they understand their experiences when they travel. And there are a number of excellent films and, you know, my usual um, response when people ask me this question is I say, well, please watch films by Chinese filmmakers. Um, please don't start with a film by, you know, that in features Western actors and Western film um, production that tries to tell you how they see China. But think about how Chinese um, filmmakers have chosen to represent themselves. And what's quite interesting is um, groups like China Highlights Tour Group often put up recommended films. They have a list um, on their website of 10 different films that they recommend. And of those, I've picked out three that I wanted to talk a little bit about today. And one of those is a film called To Live, a 1994 film. And this really is often taken as a film that helps us understand the expanse of Chinese history um, in that it follows a married couple across the periods from 1949 through to 1976, all the way from the husband who gambles to so the loss of their property to um, having to join a a shadow puppet troupe and the kinds of experiences that they have through the campaigns, um, including the Cultural Revolution and these kinds of um, really major turning points and historical moments in the People's Republic of China. And so, and this, these are all films that circulate quite widely outside of China as well. Another film that often makes these lists and that I also recommend to people is Yellow Earth in 1985. And this, um, I'll talk a little bit more in a moment, but it's considered a classic of the so-called fifth generation of filmmakers. And then finally, the film that we'll also be talking about today, Hero by Zhang um, by Zhang Yimou, which is set not in the 20th century, like to live in Yellow Earth, but is actually set um, in the kind of foundational era of China as a state, not the People's Republic of China, but as China. And it's the story um, of attempted assassination of the of Qin Shi Huang by Jing Ke. So what we see are these kinds of different moments. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about what is it that we learn from these films, and then how do these films also need to be kind of critically placed in our knowledge of China and how we come to think of China as a place um, and our ability to travel or understand it. So when we think about um, seeing China on screen, um, I just want to give a little bit of context to who are these so-called fifth generation filmmakers. And the term is really technically used to talk about the fifth generation of graduates from the Beijing Film Academy. This group um, graduate from the Beijing Film Academy um, at the time of the shift from rule by Mao Zedong, so what we would refer to as the high socialist period, and during the period of opening up and reform in the 1980s. And these filmmakers very much um, positioned themselves against the way that film had been produced during um, the 1950s and 1960s. During the 1950s and 1960s, Chinese film was very much part of a kind of state project in which there is a firm belief that as part of creating a new society, you need to create new culture for that society. You need to produce new films that show people 
how they should understand both their past, their present and the future, and the types of people they might become. And so these films often um, get portrayed as being quite didactic, as being um, simply pieces of propaganda, or to lack the nuance and kind of um, character development that we might associate with other types of film. Um, that is a whole other side talk for me because I spend a lot of time watching these films and there is greater diversity and kind of within them, although it is very true that censorship and politicized film production is very much part of Maoist China. And certainly by the 1960s and 1970s, the number of films that can be produced um, is narrowed. So the idea of what is appropriate film um, and what roles people have in the storylines is much more constrained. So when the fifth generation um, graduate from the film academy and they begin to make films, what they are doing is they move towards questions of allegory, experimentation, and they really are looking for spaces of greater creative freedom. And in the shorthand of kind of film, they usually get placed as art house films. So they're not necessarily about mainstream films. What's quite interesting about the fifth generation though is that they gain a huge amount of recognition globally. And there are many scholars who've looked at and discussed about why it is that the fifth generation filmmakers are important, not only for the way um, those in China are engaging with their past, present and future, but why is it that those um, located outside of China, particularly in Europe and North America, became so fascinated with this generation of filmmakers? Um, some argue it's because um, because the films are censored or controlled in the PRC and because this is still during the period of the Cold War where there's a lot of suspicion about China that almost anything that is um, banned in China is considered to be good globally, that there's kind of a what other scholars, um, Cold War culture scholars talk about as the negative one um, kind of formula that's being used. If, the, if a socialist state thinks something's bad, then it must be good elsewhere. And so some argue that's the case. Others argue that there's a kind of point of recognition. These films look familiar. They present China and issues in ways that um, non-Chinese um, audiences, namely Euro-American audiences, expect to see China. And so we're just going to look a little bit about this carefully. And I'm going to give you two images to kind of keep in your mind as you think here. So this one is um, a still from the Red Detachment of Women, which is one of the so-called model works of the Cultural Revolution period. It's a story about a women's militia troop and really talk kind of places women's liberation and empowerment through their relationship to the People's Liberation Army, the Chinese Communist Party, but also their own um, militarized existence as they themselves take control over situations. And so you can contrast this with what is a quintessential image of one of the fifth generation um, filmmakers. And here we see Gong Li, one of the um, actors who is frequently stars in Zhang Guimo's films. And you can see then the kinds of difference. And very much these fifth generation um, filmmakers were concerned with the questions of oppression um, both across gender and class, but also of a rural experience. And many of them then began to look through how this impacted women. But there's a real um, concern that in many ways what they looked for was women who were being oppressed, who became much more passive, who didn't have any spaces of action. And they did this in the context of reacting to the way that empowerment and women's liberation have been scripted and enacted on screens during the 1950s and 1960s. But um, for many feminists who look at this, their, their concern really is that it's a kind of mirror image. It takes them back to being lacking that kind of action, and it really takes away the kinds of questions of empowerment. So we can see the contrast between those images um, in these two films. And when we look at these fifth generation um, filmmakers and the way that they really began to shape our understanding of China from the 1980s forward, and in many ways continue to do so because people like me and others continue to recommend these films, they are stunningly beautiful. I mean, uh, first thing I should say is that the fifth generation filmmakers, the cinematography, the way that they sort of create the films, um, these are masterpieces. And so I recommend watching any of the films by Zhang Yimou, Chen Kai-ge um, and others. These are just, you know, these are superb pieces um, of filmmaking, but they've also come to shape our imagination of what we know about China. And I think what we need to do as we're thinking about, well, if this is how I'm gonna learn about China from a distance and be an armchair traveler at the moment, how do I situate that knowledge? And how do I then understand what those making the films were trying to address at the time.
And so what we know with the um, moments of Chinese intellectual engagement in the 1980s is that it's the end of the Cultural Revolution and with this turn away from socialism, there's a real crisis of identity among Chinese intellectuals. And many of those intellectuals begin to turn to Western philosophy um, and to look towards other ideas that they haven't really had access to or the freedom to think about in public discourse um, during the 1960s um, and through the early 1970s. As, as many turn to Western philosophy though, there's also a concern about is Westernization actually the direction to go or is there some other kind of place where you can look for a Chinese identity? And so for many in this, um, what happens in the 1980s in the Chinese um, intellectual culture is looking towards indigenous identity of Chinese culture. So in the root seeking moment, there's a, a great deal of exploration of Confucianism, Neo-Confucianism, Zen Buddhism and Taoism. So going back to those periods that they considered as kind of pre-modern before the times of Western colonialism, and imperialism, to those ideas that were really fundamental to Chinese identity. Um, but I'm hoping that when I say this, that you are kind of going back to the questions of the Orient. So, and how Edward Said thought about Orientalism and the idea that we are going back to those kind of classical texts the classical places of meaning and not really the questions of the modern engagement. And so we see in this, this kind of danger and the way that the Chinese intellectuals in the 1980s are engaging with it, they are very clear that they're looking as a response to their very immediate um, context. But the way that it's seen in Euro, by Euro-American audiences is quite different. All of a sudden, China begins to look a lot more familiar. Socialist China did not look familiar to those who lived outside of um, socialist states in the Cold War period. And so this idea that China is returning to what looks familiar to us, something that we can make sense of as they also explore these, um, has a little bit of a double-edged nature. And so scholars like Ray Chow um, have written quite extensively on this and really considered about the questions of how literature and films of this period gained international attention and circulation. And scholars like Ray Chow begin to talk about self-orientalism. Is it that the Chinese intellectuals are beginning to place China as the other to a modern West as a way of working through questions of identity? Um, and she talks about this as kind of a moment of um, primitive passions, that they're celebrating a kind of primitive nature. And, and it's kind of a critical apparat, a critical awareness of what's the limits of these. And is that how China should be seen and really want to portray itself into the future? So as we go through and think about these films, um, I'm gonna take us through now to one of the more recent ones. And this is, Zhang Yimou is, um, is considered a fifth generation filmmaker, but he has a very long and illustrious career. He moves from the 1980s when he's part of that generation is often being censored um, and controlled by the state and his work's not always being circulated to being the person who staged and choreographed the opening ceremonies of the 2008 Beijing Olympics and really um, works alongside the Chinese state in the creation of a lot of much larger kinds of productions. And so um, one film that is often brought forward as ways to understand China and Chinese history is Zhang Yimou's 2002 um, film Hero, which stars Jet Li. Now, this is a film that has a huge amount of positive global audience reception. Um, I believe it wins an Academy Award. Zhang Yimou certainly has won Academy Awards for his previous work. Um, but when it was released, many of the film critics were very concerned about the film. They felt that um, Zhang Yimou had moved from being someone who was thinking through questions of, um, of Chinese identity to really being uh, someone who was promoting what some called fascist aesthetics that support totalitarianism. That is that there was a justification for a great deal of kind of military strength and use and the kinds of ideas of absolute power. Now, not everyone agreed with the with this kind of assessment, and here I've brought forward this work of, sc of scholar Wendy Larson, and who analyzes hero in terms of culturalism. But this idea of culturalism takes us back to some of the ideas that I began with in this talk. So, culturalism, as Wendy Larson says it, um, states, refers to the implicit nation-state mandate that each nation must have a set of distinct cultural practices, ideas, and forms that inspire love and delight in the homeland are readily, readily represented and perform, and are powerful enough to lure and capture the gaze of the outsider while simultaneously appearing authentic in the eyes of the insider. And here I'm very much interested in how she defines this at the end because it does take us back to these questions of who we see um, 
and how we see. So who do we see as representing China and how do we see China in this context? And her emphasis here that the way that you talk about culture and what gets um, can be used to represent the homeland, that is in this case China, have to be both able to capture the gaze of the outsider, they have to look recognizable and understandable to the outsider, while they also have to appear to be authentic in the eyes of the insider. And so what's interesting with Hero is that it moves from um, films like To Live that I've already talked about, um, or other films by Chung Kai Gu, it moves to kind of not to look at the period in the 20th century history, but it actually goes right back to the foundations of the Chinese state. So rather than talking about the experiences of socialism and the way that created and affected um, Chinese people, it just goes back to kind of, it moves all the way back. It moves right back to the beginnings. And I'm going to just show the official trailer for this because I think it's um, worth seeing in this context. So I shall um, stop sharing that screen. And I believe now, as I move over here, I will share the different screen and I should be able to pull this up. Um, and I'm hoping that, okay, let me just get to, I'm hoping that we are now sharing my clip <laughs> or that someone will tell me if that is um, not happening. <laughs> soldier with no name, a warrior with supernatural skill, and no fear, on a mission of revenge against the army that massacred his people. the wrong things right, he must take on the Empire's most ruthless assassins and reach the enemy he has sworn to defeat. So um, you can see kind of the, I mean, the production value as it goes through there. I'm just going to pull up my screen again. I'm hoping I will get to the correct one as we go through here. And again, as we move back and forth. Um, so that as we can see um, in the way that Hero is presented, it's a quite different film than some of the other fifth generation ones, but it creates this kind of grand spectacle of power, assassination, but also using the language of revenge and the kinds of, um, and vindication for a past. And these are kind of languages of, and the way that massive numbers of people are mobilized and the way that they kind of create up, create these confrontations. And so when we look at Hero, there's a great deal of um, critical, reception on what the film actually does and how it operates. But again, as I sort of talk through this and my kind of joys and perils of being the armchair traveler, it is a film that I would highly recommend watching because it does get at a sense of how is China representing itself through its directors and others at this particular moment? What are the historical moments that have meaning for them and the narratives? And then I think always asking ourselves, well, why does this seem so convincing or so, um, why is it easy for international audiences to see in this film what we think China is about? And I think those are always the questions to be asked.
So in this last part, um, for the last little bit of the talk today, I want to shift from the question of physical travel with food and travel logs, and then the films that we often look at to prepare ourselves for that travel, for understanding what we might see in historic sites in China, how we might understand if we went to Xi'an and saw the terracotta warriors and the first um, emperor of China, how that would relate to films like Hero, to think about, well, what is it that we usually think we understand of the more contemporary moments of Chinese history, and in particular, how do memoir and novels play in, into this. And so there are a number of really important um, memoirs that are written by Chinese women who have left China, often it's said that they have escaped China, and who tell their stories um, in particular contexts. And I've listed here just a few. All of these are books that I have um, read multiple times that I often teach and work with with my students, um, discuss with friends, and, wor and works that I think um, bring a great deal of information to understanding Chinese history and individual engagement with them, but also fall within this kind of um, framework of, well, what are the perils of being an armchair traveler if this is the only way that we come to know China? So I just wanted to um, bring this to the forefront here and to draw throughout a few out here, um, Nian Sheng's Life and Death in Shanghai, um, Zhong Chong's Wild Swans, Three Daughters of China, Jan Wang, um, a Canadian journalist, Red China Blues, My Long March from Mao to Now, and then most recently within this kind of genre, and I think this kind of way of thinking through the Madeline themes, do not say we have nothing. So one of the things that I wanna talk about in this next little bit is I will focus um, on wild swans more um, directly because wild swans is one of the most um, popular memoirs and it has a huge impact on how we understand China and the kinds of dynamics between them and the way that we think of the history of the Cultural Revolution and that period in the 1960s and the ideas of, ideas of socialism and whether or not it has any relevant, revel, relevance to China of the past or even and to the present. So when we look at Wild Swans, um, what's quite clear is that it's written with a strong sense of a victim narrative. And one of the things that Zhong Chang writes in this, um, in her memoir, comes around the time of the arrest of her father as a so-called capitalist rotor, somebody who's um, worked against the people. And she writes, it was from this time that I developed my way of judging the Chinese, dividing them into two kinds, one humane and one not. It took an upheaval like the Cultural Revolution to bring out these characteristics in people. And when I was um, preparing for today, this this passage from her book really, really struck me. So again, because she said, well, I started to judge the Chinese by dividing them into two kinds, one humane and one not. So the idea that some were, you know, humane human beings, um, that they looked, in this case, if we go back to Edward Tate, looked more Western, acted more Western, they were rational developed, and one was not. They did not have rational experiences. And one of the ways that a victim narrative really works within this framework is that it allows us to make sense through an easy division of what kinds of actions are appropriate, which ones should we simply take out of history and see as aberrations or things that we need to work against. But what's happened particularly in this is that there's been a great deal of critical assessment of books like Wild, um, Wild Swans. In particular, scholars like Xu Kong draw attention to the way that Zhong Chong attributes violence almost throughout the book to personal animosity or revenge. And I have a long quote here from Kong because again, I think it's the contemporary context um, that really has me thinking about these issues. And Kong writes that to only talk about violence in moments like the Cultural Revolution or in Chinese politics more generally or Chinese society as the as the consequence of a personal animosity or revenge, that what we do is we take out the kinds of structural issues that are being addressed at the time. And Kong writes that to do, um, to sort of only use the victim narrative is quote, to is a failure to explore more deeply rooted causes of revolutionary culture of hatred and conflict. Readers have little impression of the real complexity of the communist regime, particularly the resentment that developed against those in charge of opposing factions and against those such as Chong's family who had enjoyed a privileged position for most of the communist period. The Cultural Revolution was not just a handful of evil people attempting to seize power. It flows as a consequence of a whole political system and leaders who nourish such a revolutionary culture only to be later punished by it. In this light, Chong's father's devotion to Mao's revolution is not innocent. <laughs> 
And I'm really interested in thinking about this in this context um, and in our current moment, because what Kong draws our attention to is that often when we look at memoirs, and particularly those that have given us information about the Cultural Revolution. It is, they are written by those um, who are persecuted during this period. This is primarily the intellectuals. They're people who um, were seen to be counter-revolutionary, working against the revolutionary movement. And so they are often those who enjoyed a privileged position. And when we look at this, we want to think about, well, how do privileged positions allow you to narrate history in per particular ways or to tell us about a place and, and what's unfolded and the complexity of that society without acknowledging the privilege? And I think um, what we see with Chong's memoir in Wild Swans is that privilege is not acknowledged in any way. Rather, it becomes a kind of personal animosity. And many have commented about how Chong does not talk about when her own family act as the victimizers, when they perpetrate violence against others, that these are simply sort of excused in the moment as um, as kind of aberrations or not, and they're not really accounted for and they don't have the complexity. And so when we look at this, we really want to look at the relationship of how do we come to narrate these ideas without flattening out? So how can we really think about personal experiences of visiting a place of having been part of a moment of a history, but also thinking about how violence and moments are part of political systems and that we need to kind of keep those in play, whether we are the armchair traveler, we are someone who's explaining our experiences, having traveled to somewhere or trying to analyze on a larger scale. And when we think about this idea of violence by a few, one of the things that I think is important is when we look at things, uh, moments in China and the history of the People's Republic of China, like the Cultural Revolution, since the 1960s, the official view in the People's Republic is that the violence of the Cultural Revolution was caused by a handful of extremists. And those extremists include not just the Gang of Four, but um, also Mao Zedong as the chairman and leader of the PRC. But others, including film director Chen Kai-ge, who um, we've already spoken about as a member of the fifth generation of filmmakers, have asked, I think, a very provocative question. And those like Chen Kai-ge have asked if it's really possible for leaders alone to cause the breakdown in, of an order without millions of collaborators. That is, is it really true that others are simply always victims. And I think Chen kai Gu's statement here is incredibly important. He says, when asked about individual responsibility, people always talk about political pressure, blind belief, collective decision and the like. But when all people are quote unquote innocent, then those who are truly innocent will forever be stuck in hell. And I have kind of come through to this statement as a way of, um, bringing us around to thinking about, well, what's the role of some of these travelogues by asking, well, how then do we hold the memoirs, these ways of kind of personal encounters, which are so compelling and so important in how we come to understand experiences of the world and places and places and moments that we ourselves haven't participated in. How can we take those kind of individualized ways of telling stories and also ask at the same time, about why they make sense to us. Are we really assuming then that there's kind of a Chinese people who are not rational, who are really not humane, who are sitting there and are waiting to sort of act because of animosity, personal revenge, and that this is what motivates them and that it leads to violence, that there's kind of a violence um, inherent in certain types of, types of people and that only when they become disciplined, assimilated, when they become in the worlds of Edward Said, more controlled so that they understand how to act more like Westerners, that they will move outside and beyond this. And Chen Kai-ge asks us, is that really true? Is that how it worked? Or were there collaborators, people who also were part of the system and the structure? And then how does privilege operate within that? And so again, these are all highly recommended books as we think about them, but I would always encourage us to think about what's the next level of questions we want to ask ourselves as we come to try, try and know China from afar. And in this context, then, um, the Ch Cultural Revolution, of course, is a very heightened place of um, political, um, of contested political meaning. And so I bring here as well um, the photo photographs and that have been shared by Li Jingsheng when this is one of the photographs of the Cultural Revolution are really important. But I remind you as well that even just, you know, a quick look at how they're narrated by scholars as well as um, other critics. In here we see, and I've highlighted the words for you, that the photos evoked mass madness, emotions of hatred, obliterate obliterate their kind of human impulses. And so the, the Chinese again are seen as being non-human in this moment that takes us away from thinking about, well, is this helping us to better understand Chinese history and 
how contemporary China is so marked by that historical moment? Or is it allowing us to simply understand China within those categories of a broader Orientalist discourse that Saeed has already sort of drawn our attention to? And so we wanna know China from afar, we always have to ask these questions of ourselves. I will now sort of bring us forward because I think probably many in the audience are familiar with um, the with Madeline Thane's book, Do Not Say We Have Nothing. And this um, has been a hugely popular um, book as it sort of helped us think through multiple generations in China. And one of the things that I really appreciate here, and I have a quote from Madeline that I, Madeline Thane that I'm going to read here that says, I think whether I'm writing about something that is close to home or far afield, I continuously question what I think I know. What we assume and therefore project onto the world takes up a lot of our brain space. Predetermined knowledge can blind us from seeing what's right in front of us. That was the great joy and challenge of writing, do not say. Now, I think um, whether it's book club, critics, um, literary scholars, others, many have really um, given positive assessment to um, do not say we have nothing precisely for the way that it takes up the complexities. And so here I draw our attention to this idea from um, Thane about this, uh, that we have to um, constantly question what I think I know. And that assume, and I love her phrase, what we assume and therefore project onto the world takes up a lot of our brain space. And that what we want to actually do is open up some of that brain space and that traveling, coming to know somebody somewhere else is not about using the occupied brain space to find its location and categories within there, but it's really about asking us to open up that space and to think about and question what we know, why certain parts of knowing a place, a people, um, a culture make sense to us and why others we don't think um, fall within that. And so I wanted to um, kind of come around to her work at the end as well, because for those who've read the book, you'll know that the way that memories of um, Tiananmen Square in 1989 are situated within it is a key part of the narrative structure. And as we think about this question of what we think we know, how and where violence might take place, um, I know many of us in a broader context are also thinking about what's happening with Hong Kong um, and the imposition and the recent passing of the national security law that um, removes many of the civil and political rights of those in Hong Kong. And that for the first time, the, demonst the vigils for um, June 4th are not being allowed in Hong Kong itself this year. And so I think these are all of our questions about, well, how do we come to know places? How do we understand them? And then also, how do we think about those who are involved in kinds of pushing back against people in positions of privilege, where violence gets placed there, and how we work to both narrate that and also encourage ourselves to question what we think we know. And so I will leave it there and I welcome people's questions and feedback. Thank you very much, Dr. Chen. That was fascinating. Um, so uh, I just encourage everyone that they can post their questions on Slido. Um, can I, before we get into those questions, can I ask you a question? <laughs> yes, you certainly can. <laughs> um, there was, that was really interesting to see the various different, um, um, I, I, you know, I didn't know much about that movie hero. I'm glad that you, you, you showcased that. And it was interesting that the director is Quentin Tarantino, who's an American director. Um, so um, I was wondering if you could share with us, maybe what is one of your uh, favorite and least favorite um, in terms of from depicting, uh, you know, an accurate culture or history uh, of China? Oh, that is such a hard question. So the films that I talked about, things like To Live, um, the fifth generation ones, Raise the Red Lantern, to me are really important. I have to say that in this moment, though, you know, um, Tracy, I am really so much the historian. So films really have meaning to me, not only for what's on the screen, but actually for the whole context of how and why it was produced and what people, what kinds of questions and debates they were trying to um, locate themselves within. So I am a, you know, a huge fan of some of the very early films. Any of students of mine will know, and I'm often asking them um, to watch an, an early, one of the early film that's called The Goddess, which really is about a question of, um, 
the way that prostitution, women's lives kind of operate, but also the kinds of limited space for movement. It's a beautiful black and white film. Um, in Chinese, it's Shinyu, but it, The Goddess is one of my favorites because I think of the way that it's a powerful mobilization of a media to in, participate in discussions of what China looks like and how it's experienced by people who are oppressed at one moment, both by class and gender, and to try and imagine something different. So to ask people, what might it look like differently? Um, so, that is, you know, for me, those are some of the favorite films that I look at. My least favorites, um, it's really hard to say. I have spent the last, um, my last major research project was actually traveling within China with what we call mobile film projection units, people who are taking films to rural spaces. And um, in the current moment, this actually goes to much of what I was talking about today. Because when we first went to do this, we thought we knew what it meant to show film in a rural space. We thought when we said, you know, please take us to a village with you to show the film that we had in our, our mind what that looked like. And most of us were quite seasoned researchers in China. But the first time we went, we were taken to, you know, a white brick building on the side of a highway and they set up the film. And I said, this isn't what I, you know, we wanted to see films in the village. And they said, yeah, it's still the village, but it's been reclaimed for certain kind of development. So that, I think, in that experience was the first moment of saying, hey, you know, let's all ask what we know and why we think we know it. Um, but in that context, what I learned as well is that the way that the Chinese see film and the films that are um, portrayed are being screened in these contexts are a lot of um, war-based films often set in the anti-Japanese war of resistance, but they're filled with violence and they are, um, and violence in a way that wasn't depicted in the 1950s and 60s. So the violence against women is very much normalized. Um, as a way of underpinning a certain kind of Chinese nationalism and to sort of show a kind of humiliation. And so it's a whole, it's not a specific film, but it's a whole genre that I find really disturbing and troubling um, in that it is also so getting increasingly tied to um, a Chinese identity that's being promoted by the Chinese, uh, by the state at the moment. And so for me, it's that kind of genre of films that, well, they are all historical, and they actually are quite accurate with battles. Accuracy does not really, um, isn't the question. It's about the work the films are doing in the moment and the kinds of imagery that are sort of being promoted as a way to gain meaning for um, um, people. So yeah, that's a bit of a long-winded answer, but. <laughs> well, I think most of us are probably familiar with Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon, which was a beautiful film in many ways, but also <laughs> as you're talking about with violence, yes, it, it absolutely is. I mean, there's a lot of layers to that movie, right? And at one Number of awards, um, uh, but but it's interesting that you that that's exactly what I was thinking too. Is in terms of depicting a certain type of image uh, or historical time period of China. Yeah, I mean, all of us. I love Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon, and you know, I think that these are films that we just gets us back to that question of was it made, you know, for a Chinese audience or was it made for, you know, Euro American audiences to try and kind of a point of connection? And there's always this debate around martial arts films and how they're positioned. And so, but I think you know, many within China felt that it just wasn't that good a movie, or they weren't surprised by it all. Whereas the rest of us were like, this is fabulous. And so, and I think. In movies like Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon, there's a lot of nuances also in questions of how are women portrayed, what can they do, and I think these are really interesting. Um, so that is actually a film that I enjoy immensely, um, in the same way that I probably enjoy, you know, things like Star Wars. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, we've got a few questions have come in now. Um, the first one is: Could you comment on Jan Wong's uh, book? Um, this person read it when it came out, but hasn't looked at it since. Anything, if you're in, able to comment on it. That's the, you know, it, that book is so interesting. And it's been a number of years since I have read, read China Blues as well. But I think what we see in that is that it falls within a larger kind of grouping of types of memoirs of um, activists and radicals in the 1960s that um, then tell their life story and their kind of development as um, radicalism being a moment of kind of, you know, teenage misdirection. And then you come back and you realize and you be kind of kind of return to your normality. And this is quite common, whether it's 1960s activists um, and what's often known as the kind of, uh, certain, you know, the declension thesis around there. And I think Jan Wong's fits in that moment um, in the idea that when we look again, a lot of the materials in the 1960s coming from the People's Republic was produced by them. And so the positive sides of how you might imagine a new society under socialism for many outside China is all they knew because 
people didn't have access to China in the way that we were thinking about it. In some ways, the moments are quite parallel. So what do we know about it? And so she goes in and she talks about this commitment to trying to build a new society and then really comes to a point where it's not something she can support anymore as a political or um, even individual project. But I think in the broader context, it falls into this story of, you know, this was an experiment that we would be best not even to think about. And for many of us, one of the concerns with those kinds of uh, memoirs then is that it it either asks us to go all the way back to the foundational moments like Hero and kind of, you know, look away from the modern moment, or it says that there really is no alternative except for a kind of engagement with a particular kind of capitalist um, development, uh, an understanding of individuals and society. And so I think, you know, there are the kind of broader contexts within that and that she then re-narrates her story to position herself much more in line with the way China goes in the 1980s. Um, so some are a little more critical saying that, you know, in the, well, she was in there in the Maoist period, she very much um, saw herself in line with that political project. And when that project changed, she too changed alongside it. I'm not sure if that's fair, but you know, some of the critics have suggested that. <laughs> okay, thank you. A few more questions have come in. Next question, are there Chinese companies that focus on nature travel or ecotourism in China? Yes. Um, and this is, you know, a huge part of it. So um, certainly within China, there's a broad range of types of travel, um, both and that international companies operate, but often they have to either be a joint company with um, with um, a Chinese partner or the Chinese um, companies delivering the local travel arrangements. And in terms of ecotourism, a, one of the movements in the late 1980s and through the 1990s by the Chinese state was a recognition that with the shifting global economy and the way that China was moving to be export oriented, it really privileged the coastal areas and it left many areas um, with, you know, within the interior of China impoverished and including many of these villages in places like Kunming or up, you know, up in Gansu on the plateaus, places that tourists often wanted to go to. And so the state itself invested in a huge amount of kind of promotion of tourism and also questions of um, related to ecotourism. And increasingly in the last decade or so, there's been an emphasis on Chinese spaces as green spaces and um, labeling in those ways. Many are a little skeptical whether this is about creating industry <laughs> or whether it's about promoting um, the, ec the kind of ecological frameworks. And so I think these are some of the broader questions that we have to consider in that context. Okay, but there is no question, actually, I would just add to that, you know, that having been one of these people, and this is where I have to, you know, I have to completely be honest with everybody. I love to travel in China and, you know, traveling to Tibet, the Tibetan plateaus, these have been, you know, like major, um, I would say transformative experiences for me in the way that I kind of understand myself and these encounters. So, you know, I'm bringing kind of this critical language to it, but certainly, you know, I appreciate and understand what it means to go, you know, to hike sacred mountains and to do these things because, Every time I go to China, I always try and add in an extra week where I can go to somewhere that I have not yet visited. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> um, the next question is, with the current situation in Hong Kong, what films would you recommend that would help us better understand the situation? Wow. I am not sure I can think of a film to watch to understand that si the uh, situation currently. Um, that's a great question. And I probably should have anticipated this because I feel like I am, you know, forever talking and thinking about the situation, I guess, you know, because my moment of understanding what's happening in Hong Kong and having followed the demonstrations um, for what now is, you know, almost a full year and to thinking about the new place of them, I've become so dependent on just kind of, you know, print media, social media posts, trying to follow things through. And I think very much in this context, just like I've been talking about trying to, you know, kind of ask myself, well, why do I think so? certain ways make more sense of understanding this um, than others. So I'm not sure I have a good answer for that one at the moment. Um, yeah, it's just such a complicated situation. I'd be happy to talk a little bit more about, you know, how I think we're coming to know what's happening in Hong Kong, but I'm not sure I have a good suggestion for a film to watch to help us understand the circumstances. Well, why don't you speak on that then in, in terms of um, other things in that, that better learn what's going on? <laughs> 
Well, you know, this is, it's, it's such a complicated um, context. It's just, you know, there was one day where I said to everyone, you know, could things just slow down a little bit? You know, we had the, we had the ruling with Meng Wanzhou, we had the national security law passed, then we have in this current context, um, both the United States passing laws that are, seem to be in support of demonstrators in Hong Kong, but that's happening within the context of, you know, increased kind of um, militarism against those who are protesting within the United States. And it just seems to be kind of, you know, and the context obviously of COVID where we've seen this kind of um, skepticism and criticism of how the Chinese state has dealt with the issues and what the relationship to the World Health Organization is. And so I kept saying different, I'm like, I don't need a, <laughs> throwing one more thing in is too complicated for me. And, but I think what we really need to do is try and read a range of perspectives um, and to think about what it means um, and to think, to demonstrate and what is it that people are demonstrating against and I've you know talked quite a bit about the Hong Kong situation with my students who many you know they're young so for them Tiananmen is not part of 1989 is a part of their lived experience but they've come to learn about it and the kinds of ideas that many of us have that Hong Kong seems a, a sort of the next step or the kind of further evolution of these democracy movements. And so that it looks familiar to us and we think we understand what they're struggling for. And in many contexts we do, but I think it's also you thinking about whether it's coming from the Occupy movement or others, that they are working against a system that they see does structural violence. Um, and so it's both about the place of the People's Republic and the power and the questions of, you know, the autonomy of Hong Kong. But there's also a criticism for some, and this is, again, not for all in the Hong Kong who are involved in it, but it's about thinking, well, where what has given China power, the People's Republic, the mainland, in this context? And so why is it that economic power has such greater stand, standing than others? And I think when we begin to look in those contexts and, you know, just really ask, what do we think it means to demonstrate? And are we consistent in what we think it means to demonstrate? So do we have a consistent understanding um, whether if we're supporting pro-democracy movements in Hong Kong um, versus people here who are de demonstrating against what they perceive to be structural um, oppression? Are we consistent in those? Or are we actually bringing to bear either a kind of romantic idea of what we think is happening elsewhere, um, our own fears about what happens closer to home. And, you know, so my real thing is I would say, you know, read broadly, there are a number of English language newspapers that come out of Asia um, and things, you know, whether it's South China Morning Post or Hong Kong based ones, as well as what's coming out from um, the mainland, from the PRC, understand how they under, what is their logic? What do they see and perceive? Because I think it's too easy for us to say, oh, that just doesn't make sense to us. Um, it's outside our belief system. And for me, I'm a historian who thinks always about what are the arguments and the logic? So understand what others are thinking so that you can engage with what how that comes to be um, rather than just dismissing it outright. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Uh, not, uh, this is a very interesting question. Um, are Aboriginal Chinese people in China born of a certain era in a historical cultural sense or, or are all Chinese people born in China considered Aboriginal? <laughs> so that is a great question. And I would say, um, so in China, they don't really use the phrase um, Aboriginal. I think I made a reference in the um, fifth generation filmmakers to sort of indigenous Chinese culture. So this idea of what was Chinese culture before their um, contact with Western societies, with imperialism. And so what they thought of as kind of a more pure sense that they could trace back to Confucianism, Neo-Confucianism, um, Taoism and Buddhism. So kind of thinking about how that had come up through a much longer tradition. But in the more general sense in China, um, like many other modern nation states, in, in the beginning at the end of the 19th century and into the 20th century, there's a huge movement to um, categorize people by race and ethnicity. And this project becomes um, further consolidated and refined under the leadership of the Chinese Communist Party and the People's Republic of China, and sits alongside many of the um, kinds of movements in so the Soviet Union as well, where you're looking at ethnicity so that what you see happening in China is a kind of um, identification by ethnic grouping. And so there's the Han Chinese, which are the majority Chinese, and this is where when we look at films like Hero and we think about, well, what's relationship to people like Qin Shi Huangdi, the foundation of the Han China, how is that being portrayed? It almost always has to be thought of in relation to what is that saying about the power of the majority people, right? So these are kinds of the questions that come to the forefront and that's well over, you know, 
I now always get my figures, but about 95%. But there are, even within the People's Republic of China, they 56 officially recognize national minorities. And the question really is about, well, how much is the state defining that and controlling it? And how much are these questions of self-identity that allow for a kind of empowered place? And um, many scholars have argued that over the longer history, there are these kinds of ways of um, underdevelopment, less resources, kind of structural inequalities that go towards um, those who are not ethnic, are not ethnically Han Chinese, or groups like um, the the Wei, um, the Uyghurs um, in Xinjiang and others. So it's a very the question of treatment and relationships between the ethnic minorities and the Han majority is a huge issue in China. Um, but the sense of um, it's quite different than what we would refer to as the indigenous people of Taiwan who have a different identity rather, um, that kind of sense of the indigenous or original peoples is not quite the same um, in the Chinese context or in the context of the PRC. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Um, next question is how, how do the Chinese want to be perceived to understand their origins? <laughs> that is a huge question. Um, so I think there are different um, ways to answer that. Because when we think about that context, you know, I'm sure um, even the person who posed this, and this is where this online format is fantastic, but, you know, I, I think it's so much easier when I could just say, you know, did you have a particular part of the population that you were thinking about in this question? But I will kind of speculate and put them in different ways. I think on one hand, we think about, well, how does the Chinese state want to be um, recognized? How do they want to be seen? And this is where at the moment, particularly under um, Xi Jinping, there's a movement towards kind of the the glory of the traditional civilization. They want that to be recognized, the power of the long history of Chinese state. And they want to be able to position China as a kind of with a legitimate return to where it should be as a global power. And in the West, the last decade has seen this whole language of the rise of China. Um, I would say from the context of the PRC, they talk about this as a kind of revival. This is bringing them back to where they should have been prior to Western colonialism and imperialism. The Chinese always talk and the Chinese state talk about um, a question of a century of humiliation from, 19, from the Opium Wars through 1949. But then they kind of Often this state talks about the kind of aberrations of socialism that, um, you know, kind of did not allow the modernization that they thought should take place. And then this return and kind of economic development and power. So they narrate it in that way. And they want to talk about the strength of China then, the strength of the Chinese people um, and their ability to kind of work together for a common good. Now, the extent to which a kind of state produced narrative really fits how individuals would like to see it, I think, you know, is a very big question. And also when we begin to think in the broader context of Canada, you know, I do a lot of work in the Chinese community. And so, you know, I'm very well aware that even within Manitoba and Winnipeg itself, those who would identify as Chinese who came um, in the 1950s or 1960s have a very different understanding. And they may be from Hong Kong or Southern China, have a very different understanding of how they might want to be portrayed and thought of um, as Chinese and what the relationship to China as a state is, um, are, and then those who came more recently or those who came earlier on and were subject to the head tax. So it's a very, it's a very, um, I think, diverse set of experiences and answers. And that, you know, again, I think it's appreciating that there isn't really one answer to how people want to be portrayed or understood or how that history has meaning. Um, because what we do learn from memoirs is that how you experience a historical moment has long standing effects on how you understand yourself. And often those can be quite traumatic. And so how, and that everyone should be able to narrate those in the ways that make sense to them. But our jobs as readers um, and kind of is to ask critically why it makes sense for us, why we accept some things and not others. Mm -hmm. Another interesting question is what territories would you consider to be China? Now, Kong, Tibet, Macau, Taiwan, and the Uyghur provinces. I'm not sure if I pronounced that correctly. So that again is one of these incredibly loaded questions on um, the border areas um, between China and its neighbors. And here I've been kind of using shorthand China for the phrase of the People's Republic of China. And as a historian, this is something that we always struggle with. What do we mean by China when we use that phrase? And often there's a question of should you readily accept 
the definition of the territorial framework that the Chinese, um, the People's Republic as a state gives you, recognizing that many of those border areas are contested, that there are successionist movements, there are independence movements in various areas, um, Tibet, Xinjiang, these are all parts of them. Clearly, um, the relationship to, with Taiwan is a fraught one, and this question of whether or not Taiwan, as the PRC would claim, is a province of um, the mainland, and that's, you know, kind of been an open issue since 1949. And then currently this question of is Hong Kong part of China? Now, um, the U.S. government has clear, has now indicated that they don't see it as significantly separate and that will have, that's about threats in the kind of international political realm. And, but it's also about what does the national security law do? Is there still one country, two systems? So, you know, I have to say that when I use the phrase, um, I either use it in its kind of loose, broad phrase terms, or I am working usually with how it plays out um, kind of as the accepted territorial unit at the specific moment that I'd be talking about. So, you know, and because as a historian, what China looks like, you know, in the mid 19th century is not the same as 1949. So the kind of territorial framework, but it's a really good question. And I think reminds us that even when we start talking broadly and we say things like, you know, oh, you know, I'm learning about China, I'd like to visit China, that that already has brought into our minds a geography. And um, I had meant, and I think I pulled off my slide because I was, you know, looking forward to questions, but I'm going to just read out then the quote that I had meant to close with because I think it's completely appropriate here. And this is just to return us to the ideas of Edward Said. And in Cultural Imperialism, one of his 1994 books, he wrote, just as none of us is beyond, is outside or beyond geography, none of us is completely free from the struggle over geography. That struggle is complex and interesting because it is not only about soldiers and cannons, but also about ideas, about forms, about images and imaginings. So I'm glad that you gave that question because it got me right to one of the points I wanted to kind of bring up and remind us that geography is both about a physical place, but also what we imagine. Mm -hmm. Yes, a very powerful quote. A um, few more questions left. Um, are we observing an increase in prejudice and attacks on ethnic Chinese driven by ignorance of various forms? And are there any suggested approaches to help neutralize them? Um, I really appreciate that question. And I think um, my answer would be yes. I think that in the context of COVID-19, we've seen um, the way that fears and uncertainty for individuals and society has um, kind of allowed for expressions of racism that I would suspect for many are even surprising to themselves. Um, and this idea as well that's been sort of supported either whether it's conspiracy theories or um, governments or kind of questions about what's happening in China and, and really how things like COVID began to spread really began to traffic as well in that kind of language that I already talked about of the yellow peril. Some people are more dangerous to us. Some bodies are um, sites of contagion, that they're dirtier, that these are um, kinds of issues that come forward. And you know, well, we can understand in one context how a con how fear and uncertainty bring that forward. We have to, I think, really ask ourselves, well, why? And it, this just goes back to the main point of these things. Why do we think certain ideas? And why would we accept that either um, that because someone may be from China or Asia, that they're somehow more dangerous to the society at the moment or too careless to really, you know, keep us all safe? And that we have to also be accountable if we witness acts, and again, most of this is microaggression, but if we witness acts of racism, of somebody treating someone differently, um, and, you know, I know because I'm part of the Chinese community that being treated differently um, by people who present as Chinese in this city um, at grocery stores and public places is not an unusual happening, much like um, is happening across North America and across Canada. We have these accounts, you know, we these are getting sort of reported at various times and a sense that being told you should go home, that you're a danger to being here and not really asking, well, you know, everyone, do they have a right to be here? Well, of course they have a right to be here. And so I think really, you know, the most immediate is to, you know, I think ask ourselves all how we're understanding situations, but also being willing to either show support um, and, 
talk with others when you see acts of racism, and then to think about it not as an isolated moment. Um, we're in the Canadian context where anti-Chinese racism has been part of the foundations of the nation, and we all have to address that on an ongoing basis and think about what that means, but to kind of be aware of that history, but also think about how we give people voice to articulate who they are and how they see themselves in relation to their history. Yes, thank you for sharing your perspective on that. Um, the next question is, would you care to discuss religion and treatment of religious differences in China? So the treatment of religious difference in China is, a, I think, a very um, contentious and problematic issue. And certainly um, what we see happening with the establishment of the People's Republic of China as a socialist state and under the um, control of the Communist Party is the clear um, articulation that it's a secular state. And this goes back to also the way that Marxism understands religion as being a kind of, as it said, the opiate of the masses, something that is meant to keep people inert and not active and dynamic. And so this is inherited by the, or brought forward by, the, I shouldn't say inherited because it's a very conscious choice in the way that they create, the, establish themselves. And in many ways, this sits alongside those ideas of separation of um, church and state. That's part of, you know, most modern um, nation states, but it's also used as a way to control people. And while we do see at different moments in China kind of a waxing and waning of the control of those who practice religion, so whether it's Christian groups, um, Buddhist, Tibetan Buddhists, the Xinjiang, the Uyghur, the Muslims, there are also moments where this becomes um, a way of controlling certain areas and the political realm in which they can participate. And so the question of detention camps in Xinjiang, the way that Tibetan Buddhism is controlled, or that you have a kind of bifurcated system where there's a state approved um, temples and then there are other places of um, worship. And this is kind of the ongoing tension. There are also groups like the Falun Gong who um, are persecuted by the state and then have had come to have an increasingly large presence in the international discussion about what that means and what their experiences are. And I think again here, this is where um, my comments on memoirs and the way that we understand a place come forward because we both can see and understand the victimization. And then we have to ask, you know, how those narratives of victimization are also being mobilized um, in different contexts. But, you know, the context of religious freedom in the PRC is, you know, I think one of those points that really is a large concern and falls into those um, into the larger framework of how do we talk about human rights and how do we talk about protection of human rights within the PRC. Okay, more questions. Sort of a follow-up on what you were just saying is um, what role should Canada have in the persecution of Falun Gong and Falun Dafa practitioners in China? Huh. Well, these are things that I, you know, I my work cannot solve on these and it's, I think, I have to you know, say that I don't think I have a full understanding necessarily of the kinds of different roles and, and the question of, you know, is you know, is the role of the Canadian state kind of a rhetorical say the right things role? I, I assume this is what the question is, you know, is our sort of should we just be kind of, you know, condemning the practice, but not necessarily doing that much Should the Canadian government be more proactive? Should they be taking a stance with questions like sanctions or some and other ways that kind of force action? And I think these are they're huge questions. Um, you know, I've, as my own training as a scholar of China, you know, I've been troubled ever since I sort of moved into this as my career uh, of how quickly after something like Tiananmen Square, there, being, there was maintained a language of human rights, but the actual actions and questions of economic sanctions or kind of consequences for taking military action against your people um, really weren't upheld by the global community. And so the question really is what is responsibility of the com global community around human rights more broadly? And I would, for me, that's where I put questions around Falun Gong and treatment um, or in these like, how do we address human rights violations with a state like the PRC who argue that that no one has any right to um, sanction them on items on what they see as in an internal situation. And so where does that language of internal situation come? And the kinds of, um, as we see in many contexts, the way that the state controls information both within and outside. And so I think, you know, I'm not sure what the line is because I would never be a good politician. You know, I, 
I wouldn't be good at balancing what are the different impacts. And I know, you know, I was on CJOB and other radio um, stations recently and talking about what happens with the extradition of um, Hmong in these cases, and even the way that it impacts directly on Manitoba farmers. So what are those, those kind of balances? You know, for me personally, I'm someone who thinks that action, you know, that there isn't always a balance and that human rights are one of the most important things that globally we need to take stands on and that we need to think about those um, as a primary motivation, not as the one that you kind of fold into broader discussions. But, you know, that's probably why I'm never going to be in the position to make those decisions. <laughs> <laughs> um, what would be the most effective way, is the question, for the Canadian government to achieve freedom for the quote-unquote two Michaels? Uh, yeah. Boy, I was like, all these people, they want me to solve the, you know, diplomatic problems that no one else can. <laughs> so I think in this case, um, it's the ongoing pressure. But I think, you know, I think Canada is right to show that they can't be pressured to um, step outside the rule of law within Canada and um, allow the Mung Wangzhou hearings to go through the proper procedures, which will of course include all these different appeals and other moments before any extradition might actually happen. Um, unfortunately, what we do have are the two Michaels, as people have come to refer to them, um, living, you know, imprisoned for now, is it 500 days? It is a long time, um, without the kinds of access that we think is actual due process. And, with, and so the danger, and I know this has impacted a huge number of people and takes us back to this question of, you know, even COVID was only a kind of the second moment on kind of restraining and making people feel that travel may not be safe. And, you know, this kind of way of, is it okay to travel to China or are you subject to kind of arbitrary arrest because it's part of a larger political kind of disagreement? And I don't know what the solution will be. I mean, States often use this kind of, you know, exchange mechanism. If you do this, then we can do this for you. And, you know, for the families of people who are held arbitrarily um, imprisoned in China or elsewhere in the world, you know, some kind of compromise by a state often seems like the right way to go, that people's lives are at risk. And I think these, you know, that's a hugely legitimate and important place. On the other hand, you know, rewarding those who want to work outside a rule of law system, um, is it necessarily, you know, a good precedent? And so I don't really have an answer to how you would solve this problem, except to keep the pressure up and really to work with all international organizations to ensure access or and try to ensure access so that their at least their well-being can be checked on and that the case does not kind of fall by the wayside, which is often a danger. Okay, thank you. And the final question, and it's not revolving around politics. <laughs> <laughs> and that is someone who wants to visit China relatively casually, where would you recommend a first time traveler to go to in China? Wow, that is a great question. So, you know, I think it's, it's the um, diversity of experiences. And I think this is where, you know, tour groups, they haven't figured out. So I always say to people, you know, it's, you know, going to one of the big cities, whether it's Shanghai or Beijing, um, or, you know, and again, this goes back to the earlier question, whether you consider Hong Kong to be part of China or separate from it, Hong Kong is also, you know, an incredibly interesting place to visit. So thinking about China in these different ways, um, so because they're both historic cities, um, but they also have a great richness um, of experience, I like Shanghai because I can always, I feel like the combination of the Bund, which is, you know, kind of the seat of Western colonial power and the way that develops is so close to the so quote unquote old Chinese city that you can kind of walk and move between them in different ways. But, you know, I also spent a year living in Beijing and at, you know, at that time in the mid nineties, it was one of my favorite places to be. So when I used to spend, you know, weeks just walking the street, it felt, felt like, you know, walking neighborhoods. So I think, you know, major historic sites, you know, and I, this, you know, this would be exactly what people always say, but I've been saying to my children most recently, oh, I still can't believe, you know, we've gone a lot, but I've never actually taken you to Xi'an to see the Terracotta Warriors. And thinking about, you know, for me, it's, you know, I was amazed the first time I saw the Terracotta Warriors because I'd seen numerous documentaries, photos, I'd, you know, seen all these things, I'd read so much about them that I didn't think it would have the impact of the kind of the immensity and what that would mean to kind of both have invested, but how does it mean, like, what does it mean to have this army of that's created and how do we understand that as the kind of place of rule with the first emperor? And I, yeah, so, you know, I like that area, but also because it allows you to leave the major cities. It allows you to think about um, 
you know, distance across China, you know, I would always recommend don't fly there, take the train, take the long train, figure out how long it actually takes to get places, look at them. Um, and then, you know, I guess it goes back to the earlier one about ecotourism and kind of, you know, and maybe it is my me showing too much of my cards of the kind of, you know, romantic idea of traveling in Asia, but, you know, places in Kunming, in Gansu, um, in the plateaus of Sichuan or up through Tibet, it's, they're just fundamentally different places. And in some ways, it's a little bit like traveling in Canada. You think about how many different experiences you can have, um, given the immensity of the landscape even. And so appreciating those and beginning to think about, you know, how they're sort of maintained. So, you know, I don't think it's a very, you know, good set of advice, because I feel like it's probably exactly what a tour, you know, a major tourist agency would tell you. But, you know, I think I would, you know, recommend a lot of the major sites as well as thinking you know about just traveling in different modes i think train travel is one of the best ways to see china because it does um, bring about a different kind of experience that flying from place to place um, is quite different although whether or not train travel is something that will be happening in the short term and we may all just be doing that through our armchair travel moments now <laughs> Well, I would t I would agree with everything you mentioned. I've only been to China once, and it was several years ago, and we just spent the time in Beijing. But I have to say, visiting the Great Wall of China has been one of the most amazing things I've ever seen in my life. It really is quite incredible. So, um, so thank you very much, Dr. Chen, for your very interesting and enlightening presentation. And thank you to all of you for participating today. We will be sending you a link to today's session and a link to a share your thoughts and feedback please do provide feedback as community. so next week on june the 10th our speaker will be dr jason kinderchuk and he's an assistant professor in viral pathogenius in the department of microbiology at the rady faculty of health sciences and he will be speaking on covid19 the emergence and spread of a pandemic in the age of social media so thank you again for participating. Have a great week and please stay safe. Thank you.